Welcome to this briefing with John Medved, founder of Our Crowd, the leading global venture investing platform that empowers institutions and individuals to invest and engage in emerging companies in Israel. John, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Uh, we have been talking in the past in quite different circumstances when you spoke uh, about the attractiveness of Israel to investors from all around the world. But since October 7th, we are obviously in a different situation. Uh, why don't you start with your assessment of the short-term effects on Israel's economy, and then we'll move to some predictions about the longer term. Then we'll move to Q&A. Please make sure all of you are muted and feel free to place your questions on the chat box. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Matthias Sakal, who's managing this webinar after leading a long trip for journalists in the southern area, most devastated by Hamas. John, please. Thank you, Uri, and uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. I'm going to share some slides. If Marcus, you can stop the um, beeping. We're getting a lot of people coming in, and I keep on hearing beeping as a co-host. But if that can't be stopped, so be it, as long as you guys don't hear it. Um, so let me see, make sure that this is all working here. Very good. You are now disclaimed. Okay. If any of you can read that fast, please uh, let me know. I, I would be amazed. And I hope, uh, John, you will share with everybody everything you have there, right? Absolutely. Yes. We'll be happy to, uh, put, get this to you, uh, by email so you can use it. This is, uh, you know, anything I'm sharing with you is public at the moment. Okay. okay. Um, Look, Israel has played a critical role in the world of technology, and the tech community has been the real uh, driver, call it the locomotive of the uh, Israeli economy. Uh, we represent about 14% of the workforce, 18% of GDP, 50% plus of exports. And actually, over the last three years, there's been $50 billion invested in Israeli technology companies, of which about 80% of that money comes from overseas. At the moment, as Israel is at war, the tech community is fully mobilized. Turns out that most companies are experiencing between 10 and 25% of their company manpower and reserves. Now, this is a much higher percentage of the uh, their workforce than for the country as a whole. The uh, country as a whole has about 8% of its workforce called up in the reserves, but in technology, it's two to three times that. However, the companies seem to be, by and large, handling it well because of multitasking, because of redundancies built in. And frankly, this isn't our first rodeo, to use an old American expression. Uh, we have experience in navigating through these crises in the past. Uh, companies are, by and large, meeting their commitments deliveries and service level agreements are not being affected. And we are uh, bolstered by a, a really unprecedented uh, outpouring of tech support from around the world for Israel and its tech community. Um, this is just a picture I, I just used at my own company uh, town hall where, you know, it's, it's us. Everybody here in the country has kids, brothers, sisters, cousins, those of you who are on, who are here in Israel or know Israel well, you understand that this is a people's army and we're, our hearts are with them. Um, what's interesting about this war has been the amazing civilian response. There's been a lot of uh, commentary that the civilians have really stepped up, uh, especially in those areas where other parts of the society, maybe government, for example, has been a little bit uh, in a vacuum. And uh, there are all of these incredible, uh, the, the, perhaps the, the word that's most associated with this war is a hamal, or a command center, if you will, that is being run by some, anybody with a heart, a brain, and WhatsApp. And then all of a sudden, miracles happen. So the technology leaders, including people like Gigi Levy, who's running the biggest hamal down at the uh, fairgrounds, have really stepped up and done incredible work. And whether it's 
with people donating blood or collecting food or driving people, this is really becoming, you know, quite remarkable. Um, the effect of the help that Israel is getting is extremely important. Obviously, foremost among this is President Biden, but other leaders from around the world have really stepped up as well. And in addition to that, uh, we're seeing, as I mentioned before, very strong support from the venture capital community and from tech companies. Uh, there's been a, uh, a petition or a statement, which now has actually gotten 800 uh, different firms to support. This is unprecedented. And you can see you know, that these are the biggest ones in the world, whether it's Sequoia or Bessemer Insight, uh, people like Andy from, uh, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Amazon and others. It's, it's, it's quite a, 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 an amazing uh, group of people. Um, we also are experiencing something which is a little bit new for me, which is that our companies in my portfolio, and I think in many of the venture capital portfolios here, are really taking a not just a role in terms of people serving in the army and making sure that their economic you know, goals are met and people are employed, but are actually providing key technology. So one of our companies happens to be a company called Empress, which provides the software for Israel's Iron Dome system, an extraordinary company. We have another company called Edgy Bees who are doing drone and satellite-based mapping, big article just yesterday in uh, No Camels about how their uh, incredible software is really helping save lives by doing more accurate mapping uh, in the uh, Gaza arena. Companies like Syabra, who are leading the fight against disinformation, they're the guys who discovered 100,000 Iranian bots that woke up uh, in uh, coordination on October 7th and have served a very, very toxic role in terms of the information war. And when you look across our portfolio, this is not a, a complete list by any means. We have companies like those three, but other companies that are providing uh, cybersecurity for the national infrastructure, water, electricity, companies that are located literally on the borders, and they have special issues, whether it's companies like Karar doing thermal efficiency, but they're in Sderot, or a company like Bionic Hive that actually suffered a missile landing in its facility. It's a company with Amazon as a co-investor doing warehouse equipment, or our incubator, which is uh, doing food tech up in Kiryat Shmona, which is literally about one kilometer from the border. Uh, and of course, their uh, company has now had to move the 12 little uh, uh, companies uh, to a, a little safer environment. Um, the impact is not something that you want to see, okay? Uh, the rating agencies, S&P and Fitch and uh, Moody's have all either issued warnings or, or downgrades. Um, and they're, you know, but what's nice about it actually in coverage that was in the national from the, uh, uh, the UAE, they mentioned that, well, Moody said in the past, the economy has recovered swiftly from past episodes of violent conflict and benefits from a diversified high-tech sector as the main engine of growth, said Moody's. Um, the growth estimates in terms of the GDP at the moment, and this is from November 6th, so it's only a, literally two days old, um, J, you know, JP Morgan is calling for still 2.5% of GDP growth this year and 2% next year. Bank of Israel has revised its forecast and is calling for 2.3% uh, growth in 2023 this year and 28 These are all subject to change. And of course, a lot depends on how long the war is. Does the war stay a single, essentially single plus front, or does it really become a multi-front regional war? And uh, But in general, what's, what's interesting is that you can see from prior wars that the impact on the Israeli economy and growth in GDP and whatnot, while immediate in the beginning of a war, 
always leads to a further period of growth. And here you're seeing uh, Israel's growth in uh, GDP per capita, as well as GDP over a you know 20 plus year period with the different wars overlaid. And if you look at it, and we probably need a little uh, more uh, granular view for you to see this, and you'll get it in a couple of other slides, you'll see that these, these wars have an immediate impact. Stock markets go down. So for example, the Israeli exchange has come down by almost 20% at its trough. We'll talk about where it is now. Okay, but they continue to, 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 to essentially come back, usually anywhere from a month into two or three months from the war. Not only has the economy got back to level, but it actually usually grows. And you can see that here represented by the unbelievable growth in GDP per capita, you know, from 15,000 up to, you know, 55,000 over this period of time, passing many, many other countries. But here is another interesting graph where you can see the impact of these wars on venture capital investment. And you'll see the same phenomena, which is while there is a momentary downturn, the economy continues to grow and powers up and to the right. Here you can see it, uh, the same phenomena, but against the Tel Aviv 35 stock exchange. And you'll notice here that, yes, there are these drops that happen and sometimes rather steep, but then boom, it starts to go in. So, you know, I'm not a stock picker and this is not advice and you've been disclaimed anyway, but it all much looks like a potential buying opportunity. If it, the same, you know, uh, performance will happen again, at least that's what Moody's talked about. And here you can see, you know, a question of whether or not there are signs of the rebound even now, and it might be premature to announce this. And it's again, subject to lots of change. But in the last week, there were two major tech exits, actually both by uh, Palo Alto Networks, who just bought Talon for over 600 million, and uh, then Dig for over 300 million for about a billion dollars of value in the middle of the war. Now, if you look at what's happened to the Shekel, okay, you'll see here very interesting that, again, as I spoke on October 7th, when the attacks happened, the shekel was, you know, uh, already at, you know, 385 or so, and then dropped again to almost uh, four and a half, 4.8, 4.08 was the, I think the weakest it got relative to the dollar, and then has come right back, okay, roaring back in the last couple of days to where it was more or less when the attacks happened. Now you can see the same impact on the Tel Aviv uh Stock Exchange 35 index, you'll see that there was a very steep drop, you know, uh, the first day of trading after October 5th. Okay. But you'll notice that the rebound has started happening again. We're up about eight to nine percent from the trough over the last couple of trading days. And we'll see if that rebound holds and, and uh, proves to be uh, in line with those prior uh, uh, charts I've given you. So one of the questions you have to ask yourself is why, you know, other than a, in my opinion, absolutely horrific and terrible ideology that believes in death and uh, uh, wants to destroy Israel, did they choose now to attack? And uh, it was very interesting that President Biden mentioned that uh, it was an attack not just against Israel, but against the coming peace and normalization that was making so much progress. And that was one of the timing factors. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not this is going to you know, put a, a nail into this incredibly important process, or is actually the process going to overcome this challenge and move forward in terms of historic reconciliation between Israel and its Arab neighbors. And uh, when hopes, you know, these are all headlines, which again, who knows, okay, what's going to happen. But uh, at least people like myself retain hope. Okay, we believe that we will 
continue this historic process. You know, people like myself have been very much almost romantic about this whole thing. Um, and it's been going on for a couple of years. Tons of Israeli, uh, you know, companies have gone. A million Israeli tourists have gone. And this has become a really important part of our lives and of our business environment. Um, when you look at how the UAE describes it, okay, uh, they talk about the Accords as unlocking sustainable and inclusive growth across the Middle East, which is, I think, a great way of describing it. Um, I was asked uh, right after the Accords to talk about how much money would this reconciliation lead to in the Israeli and uh, Arab UAE, in particular, trading environment. And I was quoted as saying uh, $10 billion. And my team went wild and got very upset and said, look, Medved, you're very positive. You're very optimistic. That's a wild number. It's never going to happen. Forget about it. Why didn't you just say a billion? That would have been a big enough number. Well, what's interesting is that um, literally a year later, the UAE economic minister said not 10 billion, but one trillion. Now, we're not there yet. I'm not sure when we will get there, inshallah. But if you look at what's going on in terms of trading between Israel and its neighbors, is that uh, in 2002, it went up again by the UAE-Israel trade by over 100% to $2.5 billion. We're not getting too far from that $10 billion that I was talking about as an annual number. And it's not just with the UAE, it's with many of the countries, you know, in the, uh, I mean, literally in the first five months, there was a, over 100% growth in 2023 of trade between Israel and Morocco. Now, clearly these uh, positive pieces of news are going to be impacted by the, uh, the damage being done, okay, in terms of public opinion and, and, and the, the, the uh, you know, role of, of, of what's going on here in terms of shaping the attitudes towards this reconciliation. But I believe that the logic will overcome in the, old, in the long run. And I think the most important way to look at this, certainly regarding the UAE and the Saudis, is not to look at it as some kind of a magic ATM machine in the sky that will provide money for, uh, for us, but as for joint development of technology, tackling solutions that the world needs, proving that Arabs and Jews can not only just live together peacefully, but can actually create together and 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 you know reclaim this the status in this part of the world as not a place of conflict, but a place of cooperation, a place where we can create. Remember, this used to be called the Fertile Crescent. This is what you know. This is a place where, where good things happen. And we very much believe in this. We at our crowd have gone and we're the first people to have opened up uh, operations in uh, UAE and got licensed at the Abu Dhabi global markets. We announced a, literally a $60 million joint investment project with the Abu Dhabi investment office to build uh, artificial intelligence together with our partners in the UAE, and we're committed to this vision of building this despite everything. And in fact, because of this, okay, this is the only way forward, you know, for our countries. We were delighted to have the chairman of the ADO at our uh, global investment conference, and we're very, very excited that uh, products from our company are now powering ecosystems in the UAE and uh, we're making investments in UAE funds and companies, uh, which is just the right thing to do. Um, there's a lot of uh, initiatives now going on in Israel to help startups get through this period of time. These are some of the uh, uh, headlines, and I'm going to be finishing here in about a minute or so and give you time for questions. Um, we have launched our own initiative called the Israel Resilience Fund. What I can tell you is that we believe that it's important now to get money into the tech economy and into the hands of the startup investors. 
we're launching this fund, which is a $50 million fund, uh, which will not be taking management fees or carried interest in order to make sure that people can uh, deploy this money. So I think that's a good opening to, to give you some thoughts to th uh, think about. And uh, uh, we would be, I mean, just stop the share. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as a sworn optimist, I, I happily embracing your uh, wonderful uh, presentation, except that my un ungrateful job is to ask some questions. And um, the, one of them is that the Israel you were showcasing to potential investors was the startup nation, the hotbed of innovation with some of the leading startups in the world. And suddenly this war drags us to the other extreme, to the barbarism of October 7th, the brutality of the war, reminding everyone of the bad neighborhood we live in. Aren't you concerned that this might scare potential investors? It, it certainly doesn't provide a welcoming vision at the moment. You know, if, you, if you're unlucky enough to have seen some of these pictures, it will scar you. Okay, we're all scarred. Uh, I think we'll be scarred for generations here, just the way that the Holocaust, and it's not the Holocaust. We have to be careful not to say that this is the Holocaust, but just the way the Holocaust scarred, this events of October 7th will scar our nation. And I think, uh, albeit many people around the world are, are gonna carry scars from this. So no, this is not good. But on the other hand, we're living in a complicated world, in a world where there are crises everywhere. Okay, whether there's another war going on, a horrible, brutal war between the Ukraine and Russia, there are tensions between China and Taiwan, supply chain issues, Lord knows climate. Last time we were together, we were talking about climate change. It hasn't gotten any better. And so the question for most investors and venture capitalists is, you know, oh, I'm afraid of a crisis. It's no. How do you react to a crisis? How do you handle it? What is your resilience? Because the one absolute certainty is you are going to face a crisis, whether it's a narrow crisis in your company or it's a broader societal or global crisis, you will face it. And the question is, how do you handle it? And here in Israel, we are unfortunately or fortunately, probably a little of both, the masters of crisis, okay? We've had to face these. This isn't our first war. We've had wars ever since I got here, ever since the beginning, and yet we move forward and build. And so I think that investors, once they see the data and they see that Israel grows and continues to grow, and yes, there's a momentary setback, and yes, we had terrible losses, you know, I, th I think people have, have not appreciated what an incredible blow this has been to the Israeli society. The amount of people we lost relative to the U.S., okay, uh, given their 35 times greater size of population, is essentially the amount of people who died in the Vietnam War, except that it wasn't a Vietnam War that lasted for almost a decade. It was a Vietnam War. Imagine if it happened in one day. Imagine if America had lost all of the dead in Vietnam in one single day. And that's what happened here. The entire country, there's not a person who doesn't know somebody who's a hostage or is killed. Everybody is involved. And so, yes, this is not a, a happy sign. I'd much rather be talking about all the wonderful companies and all the positive things that we're doing. But this is where we live. We yeah, are an indigenous, John, go John, ahead. You, you rightfully, you uh, pointed to the fact that investors are impressed with how governments or countries are managing the crisis. So how do you rate the performance of the government in the economic sphere so far? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> You know, look, I am not overly impressed with the uh, performance of the government in the economic sphere. 
That's I think that we need. That's the understatement. Of I'm I'm trying to be a little bit political because I have to live here yeah, yeah, after okay. this press conference. Let's just say that I think more activity, more preemptive, uh, really creative and major initiatives need to be taken immediately. Okay, and the government has been, I think, slow to react. Has been a little bit absent from the field. I sense things are changing. Uh, we're seeing, for example, in the innovation area, that the innovation authority has launched a, a special uh, 400 million shekel campaign to provide matching money uh, for startups, which I think is very important. And people are starting to get moving, but we don't have time. Okay, nobody's sleeping. Everybody's working. Okay, it's 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 it, and we need the government to take more action and smarter action now. It is estimated that the war has cost us some 50 billion shekels up till now, and we don't even see the beginning of the end, perhaps not even the end of the beginning. How can Israel sustain such spending without becoming much weaker economically? Well, look, first of all, the economy started the war in really great shape. We had unprecedented foreign reserves. So our foreign reserves had reached almost $200 billion. And so when the shekel started to drop below uh, a healthy rate, the government said we have to intervene. And they made available up to $30 billion uh, of uh, funding to, to, to balance the shekel. And what happened is they ended up spending about seven. They did it well, shekels back you know, into a normal range and uh, I think that that's in general what the government needs to do. Israel is strong. Our growth is strong. Remember, you know, we're talking about $50 billion having been invested here in the last three years in, in technology companies. So if the government has to spend billions of dollars, okay, to get this thing right, and it will, and probably tens of billions, okay, they, they should and they will do it and will grow through it, in my opinion. Israel will uh, definitely have to change its priorities after the war. Uh, how will it look from the economic perspective in your uh, judgment? Look, I, I think that um, long-term, Israel is a huge buy. Okay, I think that Israel has not just an unequaled technology sector, which really is driving the overall economy forward. It's the envy of the world, but it's a technology sector which is focused on deep tech, Mo mainly things that are really hard, like AI, like semiconductors, like climate change, like ag tech, food tech, cybersecurity, space tech, you know, healthcare of all kinds. And there is no, uh, no question at all that this pace of change is only accelerating, right? Technology is driving the world economy and Israel has a critical and enduring role to play in this technology change. And I think that that will ultimately attract investors, continue the partnerships. There are 400 multinationals who are here in Israel with R&D centers. You know how many have pulled up stakes and left during the war, zero. They're all here. Okay, they're all staying. And my prediction is that you will see more come in the next months and years because the technology that Israel provides in all of these areas is simply that critical. So there's a question, is there any point investing in Israel startups struggling in the current crisis? Isn't that throwing good money off the bed? And I think you're... Uh, answer is obvious. Well, look, you know, I, I hope it's not too obvious, but the the reality is you have to be careful when you take advantage of a crisis. So I I don't remember who was said a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Okay, but a crisis represents an investment opportunity for many people, and there are companies that are mediocre or bad. They're going to die in this crisis. And you certainly don't want to put money into them because you'll lose it. But there are many companies that are good, that are essentially 
you know, being slowed down by the overall condition where their price now has dropped because of the overall market condition. And that's an entry point. So as long as you're working with people who are adept and skilled at identifying what are the right companies, what are the right areas to be investing in, I think this is a spectacular time to invest. And we're seeing now with our resilience fund, which we just launched a couple of days ago, we're literally raising millions of dollars every day, okay? Where people from around the world are putting money into Israel in the midst of the war because they believe in the vision of Israeli technology and they believe in supporting Israel. And especially when you get a, a fund with no fees and no carry, that helps too. And you don't sense any gist of philanthropy in this or investment purely? Look, I think that there's uh, many people, even when they're investing with their brain and their talents, they invest a little bit with the heart. And I think that there's clearly elements of the heart in some of this investment that's coming in now. Yes. There's a question from Jennifer Lazlo Mizrahi, who's a great a uh, champion of climate and also supporter of uh, the Jerusalem Press Club. Thanks, Jennifer, for your uh, work. And Jennifer is asking, your fund has investments in some of the top climate innovation, climate startups. Climate change didn't stop because of Hamas attack. What is going on with the climate companies and how will that impact vital uh, climate solutions? Well, it's interesting, you know, that we're really right on the cusp of the the COP conference in uh, UAE this year, which will be focusing on climate change and solutions and whatnot. And uh, unfortunately, I think that the war has impacted a little bit Israel's uh, participation. It's not quite what was originally planned, but there will be a, a, a presence there nonetheless. Um, Israel has unbelievable technology in, in climate tech. And we're very excited about it. We're investing in companies like Blue Green Water, who are cleaning water up from the scourge of toxic algal blue, which is this scum, this, this horrible toxic material that forms on uh, lakes or rivers or even the ocean uh, because of global warming and phosphates. And it turns out that this stuff is emitting methane, okay? And they estimate that somewhere between four and 7% of the world's global uh, greenhouse gas emissions are coming from this scum. So this Israeli company has a way of getting rid of it in a day or two. And they not only clean up the water so that villagers can drink it or boaters can boat in it or fishermen can fish, but guess what? The overall planet now has less greenhouse gas emissions. And there are companies like this all through our, our, our portfolio. Companies like Remilk, who are inventing essentially real milk without cows. Okay, they're growing it through fermentation and vats and lab process. It's already in the market, you know, selling in the US uh, in a cream cheese product. And when you think about how much of greenhouse gases are coming from the dairy industry, uh, it, it, the ability to do this is really important. And there are tremendous companies that we're investing in, in fusion uh, here in Israel, a very interesting, you know, uh, uh, NT-Tau fusion company. Companies like Empress, the guys who are doing the uh, Iron Dome, they've taken their amazing software and they've turned it into software now that actually controls the iron grid, the next generation electrical grid, so that we can manage renewables and batteries and essentially you know, be much more efficient because the software that we need to really make this energy revolution work and full electrification is critical. So that doesn't go away because of the war. I think it only gets more and more important. Do you see the Russian and Iranian goal in this war as damaging any plans of new pipelines to divert oil and gas from Russia and Iran to Europe and elsewhere? Is this not a war about greed and power on the part of Iran and Russia? Look, I, I, I felt that we 
needed a better name for this war. I, I must say I'm I'm not a fan of uh, Iron Swords. It sort of sounds like Game of Thrones. Okay, like, you know, we, we need it's the Lannisters versus the, uh, uh, you know, I forget the other name of the family, but it's it's not the appropriate name. I thought we should have called this war the First Iranian War because it really, we're fighting against an, an axis of evil where the, the heart of it is in Iran. And um, it, it's the appropriate lens which to see this. This is not about just Israel and Hamas. This is about a more uh, nefarious and global attempt to uh, stop progress in this part of the world. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't put anything beyond those people. I think that they are up to no good. I think that they need to be stopped. And uh, I am... I'm very hopeful that there are many forces in the world who believe in progress. And I hope that once we get through this difficult and very, very tough uh, war, that we'll get back to making progress together on a regional and a global level. The war could drag on as uh, you, you say, experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, how does this affect the future of Israel economy? Look, if it's a long war, God forbid, like the U.S. and Afghanistan, it will be a terrible impact. Okay, if it's a, uh, uh, but I don't believe it will be a long, long war. I, I think that Israel in general uh, understands that as a small country, uh, long wars aren't good. And hopefully the uh, the leadership here can avoid it. Look, if we have to deal with it, we'll deal with it. But uh, you know, one, I'm I'm still hopeful that we're talking, you know, weeks and months, and and certainly not years. Okay, but if it if it is years, it's a, it's a, a that's a very difficult challenge that I don't think any of us have really grappled with. And to be perfectly honest, I haven't. You know, I'm I'm looking at how do I help my companies survive six months, 12 months. But, you know, in the venture world, even though you you build a company for a long-term outcome five or 10 years down the road, you realize that you have to raise money at each and every year or two. So that's my sort of time frame, And I'm, I'm, I'm just hopeful that we're going to, you know, get the job done and then, uh, you know, resume growth. Good. If it is an um, Afghanistan kind of thing, uh, you know, that's a that's a different story entirely. A question about Turkey. There's a lot of uh, goods coming uh, from Turkey. Appliances, pasta. How, how, the, how would this war affect the commerce with Turkey? You know, it's interesting. I was looking for a flight, uh, which is now not the easiest thing to do. Uh, in and out of the country. And I was offered to go on a Turkish uh, flight that, that you actually could fly. And it was impossible to get a seat. And I said, what, you know, are Israeli tourists, you know, flocking to Turkey? And uh, my travel agent said, no, no, there's just so many Israeli businesses that are still doing business. So thank God, uh, I think that the even though the political relationship seems to have gone back into the negative uh, spiral that we were constantly, uh, you know, roller coastering with Turkey. Okay. You know, I think we have a relationship where we love the, you know, the Turkish holiday places. We like Turkish culture. We like the Turkish people. Sometimes, you know, their leadership doesn't like us so much. So we go up and down, but I'm, I'm sure that where we're down, we'll eventually go back up. Okay, we are wrapping up with two last questions. One is, uh, what effect will the war have on our military industry? You already mentioned that some of our industries are on the front line. So how will this affect the military industry? Well, I mean, it's a, uh, a huge endorsement of things like Iron Dome and our anti-missile defense. And I think most countries realize that they're going to need it potentially themselves. And I think that uh, Israeli military companies, Elbit and the others, will do very well 
you know, long term as a result of this. And the Israeli military industry, you know, continues to grow. And I think today we're among the top five nations in the world, you know, selling defense products. And I don't see that changing at all, only improving. Um, and uh, but the interesting change, though, is that the future of, I think, military technology, again, depends on things like AI, but decentralized machines. And we've seen that smart use of inexpensive drone technology or, you know, figuring out how to disable some of this very fancy stuff with relatively creative methods that we've seen used against us, okay, is important. And I think that we have to avoid letting, uh, you know, arrogance or uh, let's say overconfidence get the best of us and to realize that technology is technology, except that it's available on both sides of a conflict. And you have to continue to innovate and not just have the technology, but think of how to use it and how to stay ahead of your of your enemies. And uh, the, the, the broad availability of cheap and lethal technology, you know, I think is a, is a scary thing, which is going to be with us for a long time. The last question is, uh, I'm sure you're going to like it because uh, surely money likes stability and peace. Uh, so the question is, what role can Israeli companies, particularly in tech, play in building peace and shared prosperity among Israeli and Arab Israelis and Palestinians to make the next war less likely? I think it's by investing in joint projects and making sure that we create economic horizons for our, our neighbors as well as Palestinians here. Uh, I mean, it, one of the most horrible stories of this very horrible war was the story of the loss of Eyal Waldman's, uh, you know, beautiful daughter and her fiance. Uh, Eyal Waldman is one of Israel's leading uh, entrepreneurs who sold his company Mellanox to NVIDIA for many billions of dollars. And his daughter was killed at the rave at the music concert, you know, in the, uh, in the desert. And she was an incredible soul. But what's horrible even more is that there was nobody who had invested more in terms of creating jobs, smart jobs for Palestinians than Eyal. He has operations in Rawabi, I think in Hebron, in Ramallah. And he actually had an operation employing programmers in Gaza. And uh, he's been interviewed since the war. And he says he's going to continue, you know, despite the fact that his daughter was murdered in the most horrible way in this attack. He believes in going forward. And I think that that's the right way, okay, which is that we're going to live here. We're not going anywhere. And we have to live together. We have to build economic ties and, you know, create better lives for everybody not just for the state of Israel, but for, you know, not just every group in the state of Israel, Arabs and Jews and Jews and, and Christians and everybody, but for the entire region. And I think that wins. It might get setbacks. You know, we might be, God forbid, attacked again. Okay, hopefully never from uh, Gaza if we're successful here, but uh, we will continue to move forward. We haven't let it stop us in the past. And we're not going to let it stop us now. John, I, I said this was the last question, but somebody is asking for a very important tip. So, uh, and you are the maven uh, uh, on this. So can you give advice for Mass Challenge Israel founders uh, that are finding it difficult to speak with investors as the focus turns to war? How can they best position themselves? Uh, and more importantly, stay motivated as they are affected personally, emotionally, and their team gets called up. So look, it isn't easy being an entrepreneur ever. Being an entrepreneur is, is, is not for everybody. It's a tough job, okay? There are always, you know, pressures on raising money, on hiring people, on competition. To be an entrepreneur in wartime is truly hell, okay? It's really not easy. And my heart and my 
understanding is with every one of these mass challenge and all the other thousands of entrepreneurs and key members of companies who are fighting a multi-front war in their own lives because they have to go home and they have to take care of their family. Some of them are called up. We have CEOs who are in the, in the war. We have, we, we have pilots who fly missions and go back to the office to code, you know, at one in the morning. People are, are, are working almost in an inhuman level. And that's why this war has to be quick because we, it's very hard to sustain this kind of effort. But the answer is that companies that were built in a, in a crucible, that were built under this kind of tension and pressure, often turn out to be great companies. You can see that they're in the past, it, after recessions, that's when the big, wonderful companies got built. And if you managed to make it through, you are going to be an incredible entrepreneur. You're going to build a real company that will last. And if you need help raising money, write to me, john at rcrowd.com. I can't guarantee you I'll invest, but I'll certainly provide you with leads. We're all in this together. There are a lot of people who are helping uh, entrepreneurs now connect with uh, investors overseas. Uh, Startup Nation Central has got an initiative to go do that. Uh, we'll be happy to help you as well. And uh, there is money out there. There's a lot of money. And mm -hmm. money is looking for great ideas, great technology, but great heart and passion. Really and if good. you can get through this period, you can do it. So. Thank you. Um, never, never say never. I said this was the this was the last question, but uh, Bettina Meyer from RDF, the, the German Broadcasting Authority, joined lately, and she asked about the potential loss of income uh, from uh, or, or damage from the fact that uh, workers from Gaza will stop working in Israel or maybe from the West Bank as well. What are your, I appreciate the quick uh, answer to that. Sure, look, I think that uh, whether they're workers from uh, Gaza or the West Bank, this is obviously a, uh, you know, an, an impact uh, more important even are the foreign workers from Thailand, Nepal and other countries. Israel doesn't have enough labor here. And so we need labor. And I expect that again, as in past wars, the a temporary cessation of this uh, external labor will be temporary, and that we'll go back and we'll employ and create, you know, great jobs for people who want to come here and be peaceful with us. Thank you, uh, guys. I want to thank uh, Last Term from uh, our crowd, and please be in touch with her for the, all the material of uh, of John. John, thank you so much for your uh, uh, wonderful presentation and inspiring words. We hope to see you soon after the war. Uh, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Stay tuned to our next event. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you.